Welcome to Gay USA. I'm Andy Hum. I'm Ann Northrup. And uh, this is our special post inaugural program here at Gay USA. And we're going to discuss the impact of the new Trump administration with a panel of leading activists and journalists for the full hour. Uh, reading from left to right, I hope the cameras can catch him that way. My old pal, Linda Villarosa. Thank you for being here, Linda. Award-winning journalist, author, editor, novelist, educator, currently running the journalism program at the City College of New York in Harlem. She has been an editor, uh, executive editor of Essence. How many, was it 700 years ago that you wrote that article? <laughs> yeah, about I think so, out? with my mother. Yes, <laughs> that was very famous at the time, uh, but has written for Essence, Ebony, Ms. Salon, The Root, many others, and currently runs Via Rosa Media with your mother and your sister, publishing uh, African American content in uh, books and uh, and I'm very interested to talk to you about uh, uh, the students you're teaching. You were also the uh, science editor at the New York Times. Assistant written. science editor. <laughs> Can't okay. give me a promotion. I want to. <laughs> and the author of Body and Soul, The Black Woman's Guide to Physical Health and Emotional Well-Being. Yes, there will be no alternative facts on this show. <laughs> uh, James Essex. Uh, our old friend from the ACLU LGBT project, you're the director of it, Correct. you were one of the counsels in the Obergefell case mm -hmm. and uh, in the DOMA case at SCOTUS, uh, and you're the counsel in the Schroer v. Billington federal case uh, on Title VII uh, to get uh, sex discrimination to you include won transgender, case. you mm -hmm. won, it, won it, and um, uh, in your youth you were the editor-in-chief of the Harvard uh, Civil Rights, Civil Liberties, Law Review, welcome. In my youth. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, to represent grassroots activists, all of them, <laughs> Hal LeBron from Make the Road New York, a, a grassroots uh, activist group here, and you are the LGBTQ justice organizer. You also work with the GLOBE program, which is an intergenerational program for black and brown queer folk in Brooklyn. Uh, you are working on competent and accessible health care, language, racial, immigrant, LGBTQ justice issues, and uh, organizing that combines art and activism uh, to uplift people. And you believe in grassroots movements that are unapologetic and powerful. I think we you're in good company. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so let's start off by just talking about what, for a minute or two, what we're feeling at this point. Linda? Um, I, what I was thinking about was what happened right after the election. And um, we were at home, all of us, you know, our family was watching, and my, it was looking like it was not looking good. And I called my mother, because she was out of town, I said, Mom, are you watching TV? She says, no, I fell asleep. I said, Mom, he's going to win. Hillary's not going to win. And she was like, what? And she just burst into tears. My mother's 86, lived through the Depression, like had a really hard childhood, and has you know just been a really strong figure in my life. And then next to me, my son, who's 17, was weeping. And I just thought, oh my gosh, because I was going to say, oh, get on the phone and talk to your grandmother. Well, no. <laughs> She's a mess. Don't talk to her. And so, um, but I was also cheered because once my mother sort of pulled herself together and my son too, um, both of them on each sides of the generations, my mother said, well, I got through you know, the depression and I got through and she went through everything she survived, including civil rights, and um, said, we can do this. And then my son and I went to one of the protests the next day. And actually, on our way here, I dropped him off at the immigration march. He's, he was going there, you know, he's on his way there. And so I am really at horrified and freaked out, but also cheered. I am a college professor, so I have a lot of access to a lot of students who, some of them are apathetic, confused, not sure what to do. They've only known Obama, and some of them are really angry. And they're just trying to figure out they need, you know, I'm going to put them in touch with you mm -hmm. um, because they really want to know what do I do? What do we do about this situation? We will get to all of that with any luck. James. Well, you know, I want to echo um, some of what Linda said in the sense that, look, I, I think that we are facing um, challenges and attacks of epic proportions. This is, I mean, people are very scared. People should be very scared. 
um, there's a lot that the um, Trump administration can do that could be bad for LGBT people and for many other communities and issues that we all care about. Um, I think that, uh, that said, I think that we have to recognize um, both that we can do this. We, we have lived through dark times before, um, and including um, you know, specifically on LGBT rights issues, the Reagan administration, the Bush administration, both of them, um, and going back much farther. But we have to recognize that there's a, we're in the midst of a, of a shift here. Um, we've been, in some sense, on offense with the um, help of the Obama administration. We made incredible progress, both in terms of policy and in terms of public opinion during the course of the last eight years, decade, et cetera. Um, we, but during that time, we need to remember, we've been on defense in Congress most of that time. We've been on defense, we're certainly on defense in the states right now on LGBT policy related issues. Um, and now we're gonna be on defense um, in, with the federal government, uh, the administration as well. And defense plays differently. You do different things and we can talk about what those things may be, but I think that we need to stand up, we need to sort of believe that we can make a difference here and we need to figure out how it is we engage on defense in this next moment. Al? Yeah, I mean, I feel similarly to what they've both mentioned. I think it's really important to continue talking about uh, the political work that we can do and how we can take the momentum right now uh, that's uh, currently uh, at a really high level, higher than we've seen in probably history, in our history, at least a younger history of the millennials and really turn it into something. I think that the uh, Tea Party turned their rage into a political action. I think that this is our time to turn our rage into political action. Um, and while we have a lot of momentum on that side, with what you mentioned um, on my predominant grassroots work, I think it's extremely important for us to really build on our own concrete skills and our own network and our own ways to cope uh, perhaps outside of the systematic pra uh, uh, practices and systems that have already oppressed us, but it's on our own way of coming up with ways to really build our strength in our communities through education, through direct action, through mobilizing, and through really just understanding where we stand right now with everything that's going on. I think most people are feeling uh, sort of a combination of rage, um, being overwhelmed, high levels of anxiety, but also extremely empowered because we're, you know, we've hit rock bottom with this, so we can only just come up from here, and I think we really need to build in ourselves. It did, it did really feel great to be out at the march this weekend, which turned out, I, th I think, to be the largest march in the history of the United States. Well, if you take in everybody across the country, well, that's very encouraging. But we have to learn how to take back power. We didn't have much power before this. Mm -hmm. We don't have most of the state legislatures. We didn't have the Congress before this. And we've let a lot of that go. And that means a, 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 a kind of organizing. I like to do issues organizing so you can make who's ever in office do the right thing. But I don't feel like I can lobby the Trump administration that they'll listen. We have to change who's in power. And that's going to be a lot of work, on, uh, everybody getting together, maybe making some compromises we would, didn't want to do. I also have felt it, we're almost getting to the point where we need a divorce in this country, uh, mm -hmm. where we somehow reorganize along different lines, because we're people are never happy on either side uh, as a result of this. Are you supporting a civil war? Are we no, going to no, go no, back to that? No, 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 I don't want Brexit. any violence. No violence. <laughs> no violence, because they have the guns. They're on some side, But I do, I, I, you know, I agree with all of this, obviously, and I feel the rage. And, and I think you very politely explained how the system has failed us and how we really yes. need to count on uh, grassroots action. And I, I take a couple of examples. I, uh, I'm not as old as your mother, but I'm getting there. And I remember the Nixon administration, and I remember how we ended the Vietnam War by having a million people go to Washington. So maybe this is the biggest, but I remember really big marches in the 70s uh, that ended the Vietnam War by just demanding it of a Republican administration. And and what I keep pointing out to people is, uh, you know, you don't think we can move the Republicans. I don't think we can move the Trump administration. But I do think we can move Congress with that kind of action. And I ta I'm holding on to the example of the at least temporary stop on the destruction of the independent congressional ethics office because people got immediately outraged, flooded Congress with phone calls, and scared them into stopping that. So I think if we have enough people mm -hmm. mobilized, to me it's all about critical mass, and always has been. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, but I think that's exactly the kind of thing that we need to do, in the sense that 
I mentioned before the, the shift in public, edu public opinion that we all know about in terms of the country's acceptance of LGBT and T people. Um, and that hasn't gone away. And that is where our power is. And so one of the things that we have to do, again, talking about what do you do on defense, you know, when you're on offense, you're talking to the people who are about to make the decisions and you know about it in advance. When you're on defense, they don't tell you, they're not going to tell us what's going on, they're just going to do it. We need to create, both create a, an immediate response, just as you were talking about, and we need to create a context, and it's, it's, it's two versions of the same thing. We need to create a context where it's gonna, they know in advance it's going to be hard for them to do some of the things that they would like to do. Trump has surrounded himself with a range of people with profoundly anti-LGBT agendas. Um, they would like to implement them. Um, we need to make it um, abundantly clear that it's going to be very politically difficult and politically painful for them to do that. And when they do the first uh, thing that's, that's uh, clearly anti-LGBT, we need to identify it, we need to name it, we need to um, call in those chits and, make, and use the public opinion that is on our side, because that's the only way to shut some of this stuff down prospectively. I agree with that, but it also breaks my heart a little to hear you say it that way because I don't want us to be sort of single issue selfish on this. I think it's, it, it's ultimately unproductive mm -hmm. and uh, will get us in trouble. So I'd like us to put all of our narrower stuff mm -hmm. in a larger context. That, uh, that lifts us that all. That lifts everybody. Look, and I, I endorse that agenda, but I think that we've got to, I mean, this is scrappy fighting, right? We've got, to, we've got to like, you know, win where we can. And I'm not saying we focus only on LGBT uh, specific issues and forget about the racial justice issues and the immigrants' rights, rights issues and the Muslim issues and all of that. Those are all issues that the ACLU, I've worked at the ACLU, we're a multi-issue organization. We care about all those things and we're working very hard on all those things. But I also think that we can't afford to not take advantage of the levers that we have. We need to do it in a way that doesn't leave anybody behind, but I think it's also irresponsible of us to not use the power that we have to protect the communities that we can protect. Sure. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that, I mean, one key thing that we need to know about this, and I feel like when, you know, when you, this was being explained, and, and it often happens, that these issues are separated, and we forget about the intersectional lens, which I think is the most important, most critical right now. You know, when we think about LGBTQ specific issues, that is immigrant issues, that is racial issues. Absolutely. Those All those issues are affected. So when we're thinking about mm -hmm. immigrant rights right now, or the deport the mass deportation mm -hmm. that could be, that could fall on us more than the Obama, we're talking about trans immigrant women, mm -hmm. um, who would be deported and potentially be, you know, be killed in their home countries. And that's something that, like, needs to be talked about. So that is an LGBTQ issue. So all these things happen all at once and can be talked about and can be focused with those lens all at the same time. Mm. What do you, tell us about your experience on the ground on uh, these issues as specifically part of the LGBTQ justice work that you're doing. Yeah, so I mean, as a LGBTQ justice organizer, I work predominantly with, like, as you mentioned, uh, the GLOBE Project, which is a youth-led, it is an inter inter intergenerational group, but it is black and brown youth-led at this point. I also work very closely with the schools that are, the high schools and middle schools that are around the Bushwick era, area where our office is located. So I support their gender and sexuality alliances. So we have these conversations all the time. And then we go back into our organization and I have weekly meetings and do different, um, actions and different groups to talk about the issues that are affecting us and right now I think the main things that we're focusing on other than like knowing all on the political aspect everything we have to push and how we have to um, really act at that level is really gaining concrete skills ourselves in order to protect ourselves so things that we've been talking about a lot is self-defense uh, bystander trainings um, we're thinking about uh, what skills we need to know how much we need to educate ourselves on knowing our rights not just on immigration for those for those who are immigrants, who, for those who are undocumented, for those who have those people in their lives, which are all of us, um, but also just on knowing our rights with, when it comes to the police, right? So all these things, we're right now we're trying to just gain really concrete skills that we can apply, knowing that that grassroots work has to happen at the same level as the political work. And are you finding an appetite for action in the people you're working with? They always have the appetite. They're, they have an aggressive appetite, but I think that right now, yes, I think right now it's a, it's a where we feel that there's a dire need to act, and I think it's it definitely escalated. And Linda, among your students, are you finding that? Well, I um, run a journalism program, so what I'm trying to do is really like 
talk about news literacy and talk about fake news, alternative facts, and just get them grounded so at least we can be literate when we're trying to figure out what's going on. I mean, if you have a person in control who uses you know, lying as a defense, me you know, a self-defense mechanism, a defense mechanism, an offense mechanism, then you have, I have to be able to teach kids how to sort through what, how do you know what's real and how do you question? Because they're not, none of us is used to that. Mm -hmm. And so when we're told, oh, don't listen to what he says, listen to what he does, it's like, well, he's saying things and as, you know, we're media people, we have to cover what he's saying. But in the same time, he is doing this other thing when he's on Twitter, something else is happening, and then he's you know, talking to the CIA and everybody's focused on his tweets. And what's your uh, understanding or analysis or feeling about how mainstream media is dealing with all this these days? Well, it's interesting because there has been so much hand wringing in my, you know, social circles. Mm -hmm. So everybody's like, "Oh my God, what are we gonna do? He's attacking a CNN reporter at his press mm -hmm. conference. What's going on?" Blah 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 blah. But then. In reality, and I, um, Tom Robbins was saying this, Tom Robbins, the great um, Village Voice uh, investigative reporter who I went to a workshop of his recently, and he was saying, this is the time when you really rise to the occasion. When someone, you know, this is great for journalism. Journalists are wonderful when there is a horrible challenge. When things are terrible, that's what we like. And so, the, you know, it's like, oh my God, the more he challenges and the more he denigrates the media, it's like the more we want to correct him, challenge him, push back, and, you know, basically do our job, which if, you know, if he's grounded in alternative facts, we're grounded in real facts and reality and truth. The, the great uh, Wayne Barrett just died last week, yeah. and Tom Robbins wrote his obituary in the Village Voice, and he was only 71. I mean, he yeah. seemed like he was there forever, but he took, you know, great pleasure in going after power, and he thought, it w he said, what a wonderful job to have where your job is to tell the truth and you get paid for it. Yes. But we've also heard that uh, in this uh, strange Alice in Wonderland world we're living in, that uh, that's exactly what the administration wants, is journalists with their hair on fire and that that is only playing into his hands in some way. Well, as long as their hair is on fire and they're telling the truth, I'm fine. Your hair on fire makes you work faster. <laughs> <laughs> and do you think the Times is doing an okay job by calling him a liar on the front page, or uh, do they have a lot more to do? I think that everyone at the Times, and that you know, I worked at the Times, it's a very thoughtful place. There's a lot of thoughtfulness, there's a lot of let's get together and talk as a group about how we're going to approach this and try to really make things and so there is a lot of that so i think that right now you know it's a time of media constriction so it's not only that there is this new reality on the way you report but there's also like money problems and so i think this it's everything shaking out right now i ran into charles blow he lives in my neighborhood and he writes that wonderfully angry column wonderful columnist and i just hugged him and i said you know i just i don't know if people tell you this but we are so grateful that you are out there mm -hmm. and speaking out for all of us and he is Mr. Intersectionality mm -hmm. and so I really appreciate the work he's doing and his courage and for anyone who's doing that kind of work. So so people f are feeling very unprotected and uh, they're basically anticipating no protection from the courts in the future if Trump gets a hold of the Supreme Court we don't know what's going to happen there but the, but the courts right now are you know fairly liberal even even a lot of Bush and Reagan justices ruled in our favor and things uh, mm -hmm. how long does it take to dismantle that to where we don't have the protection of the courts well I think it's it's gonna I mean uh, over the course of uh, four or eight years of president can can have a significant impact on the sort of the the tenor of the federal judiciary. Uh, I think there's 80 or so uh, uh, vacancies in the lower federal courts um, below the U.S. Supreme Court, um, which I think is a is a comparatively large number um, uh, at a moment like this, and that's because the Senate has refu basically refused to fill vacancies for the last year. Um, so Trump will ha have the ability to put a bunch of new people on. A bunch of those people will, you know, will probably be fine. Some of them will not be not be good on LGBT and the range of other issues. Um, so right now the court is, the U.S. Supreme Court um, and the other federal, lower federal courts are the best they're going to be for a good while. Um, and I think that means that um, you know, the ACLU and other uh, litigation focused organizations are, you know, we're like, okay, let's get what we can now. Um, and I actually think that 
partly as a result of the change, the significant change in public opinion around LGBT uh, people and LGBT equality. I think that the sort of um, the change that may happen in terms of constitutional rights and interpretations of federal civil rights laws um, that may happen on, uh, on a range of other issues um, may not happen as, you know, it may not be as bad on LGBT rights. Um, and I say that because, as you just mentioned, there are a number of uh, solidly conservative uh, judges on the federal courts of appeals who have voted um, uh, the way the ACLU would think they should vote, uh, the way we've urged them to vote and others have urged them to vote, um, to protect LGBT rights, um, that LGBT rights are becoming more of a mainstream thing. And, and so I am, I'm not saying I'm not worried about anything. I'm certainly very worried about the religious exemption side of things, that whole set of issues. On basic LGBT equality, I'm not as worried. And talk about the religious exemption thing, because yeah. this is something that would, would affect all of us in an intersectional way. Mm -hmm. Essentially giving people the right, this is the bill that is before the Congress and that Trump supports. And at the state level and all over the place. That says if you have a sincere religious objection to doing, you know, serving somebody or, or you know, employing someone, that's okay. Not just LGBTQ, mm -hmm. but you could have a religious objection to a woman who's divorced or, you know, whatever. Reproductive rights, contraceptive mm -hmm. coverage, things like that. And not just churches, but anybody, anybody. could assert a religious uh, and feeling. And my, my question about that, does that override all local, uh, state and local human rights laws if they pass a federal law like this? Well. You know, it depends on what the federal law is. The, the law I think you're talking about is, is the so-called First Amendment Defense Act, or FADA. Exactly. It's a terrible piece of legislation, as you, so one of you mentioned, uh, Trump uh, campaigned on it, endorsed it in his campaign. Sessions is a co-sponsor. Um, it is just about federal law. It doesn't override uh, state non-discrimination laws. And it is focused on uh, religious beliefs or moral beliefs about marriage being a man and a woman and sex outside of heterosexual marriage being a sin. It's like DOMA in being <coughs> a federal only law. Uh, yes, and so, look, they could, they could try to write broader laws, and perhaps they, they will. At the moment, that's not what's there. Now, they, but they, that said, there's a series of, um, a, a, a lot of very bad uh, religious exemption laws, many, all of which would uh, affect LGBT people, some of which would affect a much broader array of people that have been introduced in the states. Um, and this is a, continues to be a growing trend in the states. So, for example, in 2014, there were 13 uh, anti, you know, religious exemption bills proposed in the states. Um, in uh, 15, there were about 60. In 2016, there were 110. Um, we're, you know, we're, you know, going up a curve here, and I don't think we've seen the end of that. And we beat most of them back <coughs> last year, even in places like Oklahoma and Texas. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, there's a different atmosphere, and that's the big thing in the country right now. Now people say, well, Trump won. I can call you whatever I want. I can mm -hmm. say whatever I, I mean, it's insane, but there it is. Well, and this business of... Uh, uh, white Christian men are the biggest victims these days and the uh, the people most oppressed uh, uh, that's infuriating and and uh, enraging yeah and um, just to go back a little bit on uh, like employee employer discrimination um, I was under the impression that FADA was for federal employee or federal employment specifically it, it's not it, it affects um, federal laws okay uh, well, I mean, just to insert the, if we're going to keep on calling the grassroots uh, perspective here, I think uh, this is a really important time to think about alternative economic opportunities. I think that is a really good uh, time to discuss worker-owner cooperatives or different types of collectives, um, only to think of it as something outside of just mm -hmm. our regular employment situa like, uh, situation that goes state by state or that federal law could be imposed uh, on that. I think that we need to think about different ways that we can employ our communities and maybe the most marginalized people. So um, us and Make the Road, at one point, we were supporting worker owner cooperatives and we were supporting specifically one that was predominantly a trans latina uh, worker cooperative and i think these kinds of ideas of alternative employment i think are really important to sort of uplift and have these conversations at this moment 
Well, it's interesting because you're talking about uh, self-care and, and, and us taking care of each other and not relying on daddy to uh, solve all our problems, which I think we've done too much in this country anyway. We've looked too much to some kind of uh, godlike figure to uh, solve all our problems. Right, and I think that for a lot of communities that wasn't even an option. You know, like the system doesn't even, it doesn't even apply to a lot of people within our communities. Yeah. So I think it's important just to think outside of that completely. Ourselves, the resources that we have, the things that we know, we have a lot of collective knowledge. We have a lot of collective experience. We have options outside of what already exists. Not to say that we don't need to push on what have already exists. We absolutely do. And I think there currently is a lot of momentum to do that. But we also start, have to start thinking about what we have to contribute for each other and what we can build ourselves. I really agree with that, and I was thinking about um, something that Audrey Lord said. She said, um, "I'm doing my work. You know, are you mm -hmm. doing yours? And our work is different. Like what mm -hmm. you do is really. I was thinking we need more lawyers, <laughs> and then I was thinking we need more activists, <laughs> and so we, we need, need more, more journalists. Everybody. Yes, we, we need more of everyone. But also, I think we, because of our experience in earlier activism, will be the leaders." And also to sort of sideset some of the mistakes we already made. Um, on my Facebook page, um, I have a lot of black women. And so before the march in mm -hmm. D.C., people were saying, I'm not going. It's a white woman's march. And so I pushed back on that and then also listened to what people were saying. Then after I came back, it was like it was a white woman's march. So I was like, OK, please stop <laughs> um, on my page. <laughs> Go to your own page. But I also started thinking about it. It's like we really have to pay greater attention, especially people who have not done this kind of organizing before and just are really enraged and just want to jump in to avoid some of the mistakes we made. I, I thought of Proposition 8 recently and I was mm -hmm. like, oh, what a crap show that was. And all, you know, some other things where we've made these mistakes, we've learned lessons and we need to bring them to the movement. And I really love what you were saying. It's like, we have power. We have power among young people. We have power, um, you know, in communities that are doing, that are outside of the, off the mainstream grid. We have to pay attention to that and do that kind of work. Well, you had some observations about the Women's March and in Washington on those grounds. Yeah, absolutely. I actually went to the Washington uh, D.C. march, and um, one thing I really appreciated was that it was very intergenerational. There were there were youth, uh, there were mothers with their youth, there were older folks, uh, there were different gendered people, and I think that the organizers, when they first uh, thought of the march and the intentions behind the march, they were very inclusive. I think they included a lot of different people who identified as women. They included trans women. Um, they they uh, included women of color. I think all of that was there. I did have some observations that I did think it was a little bit co-opted by a predominantly white cis women uh, group and I think that it was a really great opportunity at that moment to uplift the idea that women and to separate the idea of women and potentially their genitalia and I think that was really really done in the in the march it was very emphasized by a lot of the people who turned out um, the idea that women has to have a vagina for instance and that being the imagery and what was visible and I think that this would have been a really great opportunity to, up, to, to uplift the idea that women doesn't necessarily have that or not everybody calls, uh, well, could call their pussy, but that is not equal to a vagina. And just having those conversations about who we can uplift uh, during these marches and that being a really great opportunity to talk about the people that are in the margins, that are uh, trans women, that are people of color. And I think the atten intention was there. And I think, again, you know, it was historic and it was, a, it was, you know, it really started the culture for this and it could turn into something. Um, but I think that, you know, there was some missed opportunities to really uplift uh, for instance, trans women with different bodies or people with different bodies and people of color. I think it raises the constant tension between are you reacting to the people who currently have power who are talking in that kind of grabbing the pussy language mm -hmm. or do you redefine it uh, for yourselves to create a new uh, power in a new organization. I want to, before we get any further, I want to put up on the screen if we can the uh, uh, some websites that people can go to to sign up to get daily or weekly suggestions of actions and and marches and whatever that they can do. Uh, I've just written these down as they've come across my uh, my uh, pages or or uh, email. Uh, Women'smarch.com is is organizing post the marches. Uh, and, I, and I hear April fifteenth is the next big one. 
Oh, yeah? Yeah. Uh, MoveOn.org is sending regular notices to people about actions. DailyAction.org is another one. And SwingLeft.org. These are all websites you can go to and, and just sign up, and they'll send you regular uh, information about how to be involved. And I think that's crucially important. And we are providing on our screen and to our uh, people on our email list all of your uh, websites at least uh, so that people can be in touch with you and the work you do. Yeah, now you are working, you've just been doing some work on uh, a piece on uh, black men and AIDS in the South. Yeah. Uh, can you talk a little about the issues around that and how that plays out here? Well, about a year ago, um, the federal government released a study that said that if things go as they look like they're going, half of all um, black men who have sex with men will have uh, be HIV infected down the road. So that was an alarm bell. And so I started doing research um, for a story and went down to Mississippi and spent quite a bit of time there with um, a really wonderful um, organization called My Brother's Keeper and um, was on the ground and it was in some parts like the 80s. I was really upset after a while because I was seeing so many really ill people. And then I, and people, I met probably six young black men who had been, who had gotten infected in the last several months. So they were newly infected and they were, you know, one was 17, they were really young. And I'll, there's a, some, been some attention, that there's been some money being raised, um, you know, and sent there and some focus on the South, but not enough. And this, and I did all this before, um, he was, Trump was elected. And so now I'm actually really scared because I saw how people were hanging on getting their medication. Um, and if there was PrEP, they were getting it through, you know, they couldn't, it's expensive. So anybody on PrEP was getting it, you know, getting it subsidized. But even their medication, one, the, I had met this one guy, he was infected in July and he didn't get on, you know, he found out, he was diagnosed, but he didn't get care for a while. And I said, why didn't you get care? And he said, I couldn't afford the medication. I didn't understand how to apply for the services. And, and I'm thinking, oh my God, if that goes away, this guy has no medication. And that is something affecting absolutely everybody, right. which is the dismantling of Medicaid. Uh, they want to make Medicare for old people into a voucher program, which will kill an awful lot of uh, older people off, including us <laughs> soon enough. Uh, and, Any minute now. And, uh, and even to uh, fiddle with Social Security. I mean, uh, it, and yet these people are going before, these people who want to be in the cabinet are going before, and they're not backing up on this. They're using fudgy language. Oh, we want to have access to everybody. Yeah, if you can pay for it. I mean, so, I mean, this is something collectively which affects the health of all of us. Uh, we need to push back on very, very hard. <laughs> and, and all eyes look at me. Yeah. Well, you're the one who yeah. said, see you in court. <laughs> well, look, and uh, I, I'm concerned about the health care stuff. I'm concerned, you know, among other things about people with uh, living with disabilities um, who, for whom the impact here will be extraordinary. Um, you know, I I don't know what the litigation angle is there. Um, I, I think at the moment we're all trying to figure out, well, what does the replacement look like? Um, and who does it help and who does it hurt? I'm, I'm, I agree with your concerns about the very little bit we've heard about the direction they're headed. Well, it's sort of, you know, it's price and health care and all of that, but it's uh, sessions and civil rights. Uh, it's uh, DeVos and education. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, I've made a list here. It's uh, uh, Puzder and uh, Labor. It's uh, John Ben Carson, Carson and John House. Gore, civil rights. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. Under Sessions, it's Tillerson and International Rights. He's going to destroy. You know, we counted so much on the Obama, not just laws, but the Obama administration's attitude and what mm -hmm. cases they would bring and, and what policies they would have, and all of that is being reversed immediately, climate change. Yeah, I, look, I, and I think all that, all of those are, those are the many, many reasons that we should all be concerned and scared and motivated and a activated. On, you know, focusing on the specifically LGBT-related civil rights stuff that the Obama administration did, there, um, there's a, a range of things, but a whole lot of what, what happened at the executive agency level 
So we, we want stuff through the courts, and that's not immediately going away. We want stuff through Congress, that's not immediately going away, and I'm not sure that either one of those things is going away. We want a bunch of stuff through administration, the administration of actions, and that stuff could easily go away. Immediately, the federal contractors' role? So, some, of it, some of it could go away Housing. immediately through an executive order or withdrawal of guidance. Some of it, the stuff that happened through regulations is stuff that they would have to go through the normal process, a notice and comment rulemaking process, so it would take a little while. Mm -hmm. um, but here, this brings me back to the religious exemptions thing we were talking about earlier. There are two big picture ways they could do this. They could simply uh, take back the LGBT protections, um, which are most of them based on uh, statutes that say you can't discriminate based on sex, and the agencies have said, well, a ban on sex discrimination covers LGBT people. Right. Um, and that's true in the schools context and in the federal contractor context and in access to health care under the ACA and employment, et cetera. They could just take those back, but the other thing they could do is add a religious exemption in all those contexts because none of them have a religious exemption. Um, and that wouldn't, that wouldn't obliterate the protection for everybody, but it would take it away in many, many uh, contexts. It would pockmark those civil rights protections in a way that other civil rights protections are not pockmarked. And we should say other than a standard <coughs> religious exemption that allows the Catholic Church not to ordain women, although they should, <laughs> but they, they don't have to under the law. I mean, yeah. there are exactly. religious, there are, right. religious freedom is, is, is a, right. no, I thank you for that. There's, religious freedom is absolutely essential, a core part of the, the values of the country. It's protected by the Constitution, and it should be. Um, but religious freedom doesn't get, give anybody the right to discriminate against other people or harm other people. And I that's mean, what we're talking I about mean, here. I mean, couldn't the courts at this point, I mean, again, if, it, if Trump gets a dominance in the courts, especially going after Roe v. Wade, but couldn't they also just declare the fetus or the zygote, a, uh, a fertilized zygote, a human being with all the protections thereof and abortion is over in this country? Um, they would have to go through the U.S. Supreme Court. Yes, for that. I understand that, but I'm saying uh, if they could, get a majority, could, could, could the they, court do could that? They, could they push that issue yeah. to the U.S. Supreme Court? Uh, yes, they could. Could they push the marriage issue back to the Supreme Court? Yes, they could. Everything's up for grabs if they get enough people on the court. But look, the 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 spot that's open in the Supreme Court right now. Uh, let's just remember um, that it is a replacement for Justice Scalia, and Justice Scalia was, you know, the devil. What Justice Scalia was, gotcha. you know, not a progressive. Um, and that's why he um, has a job, and I don't. <laughs> um, so, so this this is an important uh, appointment. Um, the next appointment uh, has is the one that would uh, potentially change yes. change the, the court the, in a very the, fundamental way. The three eighty year old <laughs> liberals, you know, even Kennedy and Kennedy, uh, yeah, has a swing vote. Yeah, that's scary. Yeah. But the, the point I wanted to make about the religious exemption thing, and they could do it two ways. They could just take back the LGBT protections or do it through religious exemptions. This gets back to the power thing. Look, I think that we can, um, we can use the, the fact that the country uh, doesn't like LGBT discrimination, doesn't support that when it's blatant, um, to, help, to try to slow this stuff down. And what we need to do is we need to make sure that everybody understands that these religious exemption measures or anti-LGBT uh, discrimination. That's why they are being proposed. That's why they would be implemented. And people need to understand that so we have the same kind of public reaction when they do it this way that, they, we, that would happen if they do it through simply repealing those protections. And of course, in terms of taking back power, uh, you know, we weren't doing so well before. Uh, but with Jeff Sessions at the Justice Department, forget about any kind of protection of any voting rights and all these laws to restrict people from voting, which help very much Trump win the election, especially in the Rust Belt. Uh, you know, I mean, it's going to be very, very difficult. Well, or, do people have, my question is, do people have an appetite for political organizing to, you know, electoral politics to, to get power back? I mean, we all know how mad we are about all these issues and all the things you're proposing are great and we're gonna have to do them to, to preserve ourselves during this, but are people gonna wanna spend some time on? Some people are, and I, I think the thing to keep in mind is that we should all do what does appeal to us. Some people will wanna work on electoral politics, some people will wanna work on street activism, uh, people will wanna organize in their communities, other people will wanna work at different levels, but we really have to not uh, condemn each other for mm -hmm. making the choices we make and really support each other uh, on all those approaches because we need all those approaches. Okay. 
Well, you know, this all this talk we're hearing this week about, uh, you know, Trump saying three to five million people voted illegally and the arguments in the press about, you know, how can he say that there's no evidence? But really, the point is not for him to prove that. Mm -hmm. The point is for him to scare people into yeah. approving new uh, voter ID laws, mm -hmm. uh, to just so we're sure that that is not happening. Uh, voter ID laws that uh, are intended to and do, in fact, disenfranchise disproportionately people of color. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and anyone else they can cut out across the board who, who is not a Trump voter. I do think our challenge will be, I mean, you know, this new administration and its leader is a flamethrower on so many different issues. And so, you know, often when I'm talking to my students and they, you know, they're like, how do we think about this? And I said, look at who is, you know, he's against. Look at who he's against. So look at all the things. So it's this group, this group, this group, this group, this group. That's everybody. And so that's how you need to think of it. Don't think, oh, he's just, it's just my issue that it's like, this is one big hot mess. But we're one big group who don't agree. And I think, I actually think this horrible healthcare business is going to be the turning point for people, the way we've described it. When people, I mean, if people are confused, it's like, well, I hate Obamacare, but I love affordable care. Yes, <laughs> yes. So I'm um, safe because I have the Affordable Care Act. Yeah. So I'm glad they're getting rid of Obamacare. Okay. So when some care, some care at least. <laughs> when things start to hurt people individually, and it's terrible, but you know, and it's going to hurt the people who deserve it, the you know, who are the the worse off first and worse. However, it will motivate some people who were maybe in, you know, maybe in the other, other camp doing a protest vote or whatever they were doing. And so I think that, you know, patience, <laughs> we're going to have to be at once angry and crazy and loud and patient because this, I think it's going to start to shift. Or think bigger with yeah. a grander vision like Medicare for all, which is yeah. what we really need in this country. We're yeah. the only, like, you know, Western nation that That's doesn't right. have it. I mean, think bigger so that we can explain it to people easier and people might actually, you know, uh, vote for us if, if we put, put it forth. I mean, I'm not so confident in the current Democratic minority we have in the Senate. They don't seem to be stopping hardly any of these uh, cabinet appointments. Well, I was happy that uh, Schumer gave a pretty uh, uh, tough speech at the inauguration where he actually mentioned sexual orientation and gender identity. And that was, was a booed, shocker. And was booed from the crowd. <laughs> yes, of course. they were also Chanting "Lock her up" when Hillary came out on the stage. I mean, it's just <laughs> and uh, and he showed. We were surprised as we were at the uh, march in New York this past weekend to look down and see there was Chuck Schumer in the crowd. <laughs> But meanwhile, he's voting for uh, Pompeo to be the director of the CIA, and, and for all his tough talk, uh, he doesn't have that much power, and he, he may not be able to do anything even if he wants to, and we're not sure how much he wants to. Uh, but I think, you're, I think it's important to take that point about people react when they are personally affected. Uh, you know, people got angry about the Vietnam War because of the draft. Uh, people got angry about AIDS because their lives were threatened. And uh, a lot of this is going to be propelled by how much people feel personally affected. And even the LGBT movement, I mean, it, it really ballooned when people started saying, wait, this is my, you know, straight people were saying, wait, this is my brother, this is my cousin, this is right. my daughter, this is my son. And so, you know, we'll see. Cause and Trump got elected because people felt he would personally help them get a job, get better health care, cheaper, or whatever. I, they, I think they're deluded, but... Uh, I think he's deluded. <laughs> but I think that's why something like the Women's March is such a great opportunity to like understand what affects us personally and what affects the intersections that we, that we identify with and then all the people around us, right? So knowing that we came out um, in huge numbers for the Women's March and then just yesterday there was another action um, in support of Standing Rock and yeah. The, yeah. the executive order now to push the Keystone pipelines to continue being built and today wow. there's one to be in Saudi with our Muslim brothers and sisters yeah. and siblings. Yeah. So I think that knowing that as a group we're coming out for the Women's March, we have to continue that. Right. Because when they were when they were chanting at the Women's March, uh, refugees are welcome here and Black Lives Matter, that was for everyone to join in. Mm -hmm. And that needs to continue from that moment. But there's right. a lot of pressure from the top 
to divide right. and conquer, and mm -hmm. not just the Trump people. You know, when I saw those pieces in the Times about uh, white women are offended by the leadership of the march and think it's too uh, too much oriented to people of color, or they're not making an, uh, pro-life women. Uh, welcome in the march, uh, and, and all of that was just divisive. Yeah. Uh, and I see commentators on television talking about, well, the the speakers at the march in Washington were too divisive, and and there's this whole uh, attempt to divide, to downplay the effect of grassroots organizing and to disempower. The people in power, mm -hmm. per usual, do not want to give up power. And, uh, and I, that concerns I hate me. the commentators who, who bring in the activists and they say, well, he's, he's just taken office. Uh, you know, don't you want to wait and see what he got? I'm assuming it's, it, first of all, the yeah. whole campaign told us, you know, how vile he was. And then every single, almost every, virtually every single thing he's done since he's uh, had an appointment and during the transition has been awful. So there's nothing to wait for. I mean, that's why. Jillions of people turned out on well, Saturday. Well, people don't want people don't want to take responsibility for acting, and so they excuse themselves by saying, uh, "Just give them a chance. <laughs> give them a chance." I do think also um, some people don't know what to do. There's so much, especially with social media. It's like, go to this march, go to this protest. My, I watch my two children, and they just, you know, they're bang, 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 and they're. But I'm like, just do something. Figure it out. Meet other people. Find your, find your tribe. Find your crew, and get together and figure out what your, where your place is. And that's what I say to my students too. Just don't sit around and get depressed. Well, let's well, talk about that in more detail, because we do want to empower people. Well, the ACLU didn't waste time suing the administration. Uh, we, we did. We filed a FOIA lawsuit um, uh, the day that he was inaugurated. Freedom um, of Information Act about yep. his about uh, About um, any Conflicts information, complex, any conflicts. information that would, that is relevant to a violation of the Emoluments Clause. So is he getting income from foreign uh, countries? Um, which is against the Constitution. Uh, which is, he's not supposed to be doing. And you're hoping to pry loose his taxes with that suit, right? Um, that would be arguably some information that would be responsive, yeah. So look, we'll see what, what kind of information we get or don't get. And response. the ACLU and other organizations are getting a lot of support since the election Indeed. by people who are horrified. Which is, which is encouraging, yes. Yeah. Well, are you finding the same thing at Make the Road? It was already a very active group, but has there been an increase? Yeah, absolutely. There's been an increase of people who are just getting involved, uh, of definitely just support coming from all levels. And I think Make the Roads, uh, one of their first initial re responses to this is to just educate our community, right? Mm -hmm. So what we've been doing is we've been organizing open open hours or open sessions within our organization to inform and educate everyone on what's going on because it's, everything is happening so rapidly. There's so many executive orders, there's so many changes, so many things that are being kept hush-hush that I think one of the most empowering things that we're talking about about empowering people or for them to act is for them to understand like what's happening how it's going to affect them and how it's going to affect everybody around us and just our general culture and energy around us so I think that's one of the first things that we're doing we're trying to make sure that everybody understands like what you know the impact that these things will have right now and how are you encouraging people to educate themselves because I have to say what has discouraged me over recent years is the levels of ignorance yeah, and I think that this goes back to, to media, right, and to the, to, the, the news that are out there, where right now we're um, in a moment where we have almost an overwhelming amount of information. We're saturated with news and information. Just our social media, my my feed, there's a different thing every every minute, and they're all coming from similar perspectives because we unfortunately happen to have live in uh, like media bubbles sometimes, depending on what we surround ourselves with, but we're saturated with so much information. So I think, you know, having groups of people that get together sort of what we're doing in our in our group in our globe group is every Friday we're getting together and the first thing we're going to do is analyze things that have happened trying to have a clear understanding of what that means we're starting off all our meetings with that just to know what's going on in the environment so I think similarly people need to try to you know as much as we can try to find real factual information mm -hmm. facts rather than alternative facts and break that down maybe with each other maybe through looking at multiple sources knowing what's credible there's so much fake news out there mm. so I think sorting through that is really important it's, and it's going to be difficult because we're so saturated but mm -hmm. but it's, maybe it's a collective effort in a way what do you, james what do you find yourself doing different in the wake of this now in terms of the cases that you're looking at taking on uh etc because you have pending cases you have uh yeah well so uh the, the litigation hasn't um 
changed much in the sense that I think that, I mean, the, the only thing different about the litigation is that we are um, trying to figure out, okay, you know, if we're gonna, if we're gonna do X, if we're gonna try and create uh, this piece of law, we better do that quickly. Um, we gotta move that stuff forward because now is the moment, it's only, the courts are likely to get worse. But, but we also work outside of the courtroom. We work in, in uh, legislatures and Congress and the state legislatures, and we do education work and do organizing work. And on that front, um, we're trying to uh, you know, focus more on, on uh, uh, media and education work, again, to, uh, to get out information that we think is correct and also to mobilize people and just make people realize, look, look you can make a difference. Um, you can engage in the following different ways. We have a very large um, action email list um, that we use both for actions at the state legislative level and in Congress. And if anybody wants to sign up for that, ACLU.org, and you can just sign up for the info alerts and you will um, start getting stuff that, you, that is a way to take action, a way to express your views um, to the legislatures. Uh, but also just to uh, make sure that we do this work to make noise and mobilize and uh, uh, mobilize the support that is out there for progressive causes, including LGBT causes. Because if we don't mobilize that, we're gonna we don't we have no chance in the legislative arenas. And when you <coughs> mobilize people, do you think uh, you know we think traditionally of phone calls to mm -hmm. elected mm -hmm. officials, marches, uh, whatever. What do you think works? What do you think is uh, important for people well, to look, do? Look, I, I think the, the single most um, uh, impactful uh, thing that people can do, certainly, I think, in, at the legislative level in Congress and in the states, is call. Uh, you know, a lot of what we have is um, stuff where it's like, okay, send an email to, or, or sign a petition that we will deliver to. That is helpful, but if you want to make a difference, call your representative's office, speak to somebody. They keep tallies of how many calls they get pro and, and uh, against different things. And their that phone makes, lines get uh, clogged. Yes, too. that makes a difference. If 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 you if you and if we if if advocacy groups turn out a bunch of people, the hill notices. I'm not saying this is dispositive, but it makes a difference, yes. and it makes more difference than so, liking and, something and on we, Facebook. We showed a video last week of the hundred people who went to a Colorado uh, representatives meeting and drove him out the back door because yeah. he just couldn't handle them. So and I think showing up is uh, yeah. the least we can do, folks, is learn the names of all your representatives who represents in the U.S. House. You got two U.S. senators. You've got maybe city council and state legislators. Learn their names. Learn their numbers keep it by your desk and when something comes up make that call about this um, so that you know we can we can move on because state legislatures even in the more liberal states are going to have to make up for some of these cuts that are coming down from the feds right. absolutely. Mm -hmm. absolutely and Linda what do you think is uh, appropriate action or organizing well, you know what was really what really cheers me is in you know I go I teach at a very diverse college. And so, you know, people are in affinity groups, they're in the LGBT group, they're in the black group, they're in the brown group. Mm -hmm. And then we have the um, group that does sort of activist media. And then you look at that group and it looks like the UN. Mm -hmm. And we get into the most intense arguments and we have, you know, articles about every kind of, you know, mm -hmm. issue, all mm -hmm. their issues, everybody's stuff gets mm -hmm. covered because we're in the room together. Mm -hmm. And I think that is what really struck me. It's like, you know, we really need to find a way to pull together and, you know, whatever, it, just get, what, find your people and they don't have to be exactly like you and they shouldn't be and figure out what you're gonna do because how we have been successful mm -hmm. is when we all do our part. And I applaud everyone here for what you're doing and, you know, it's really important and it's important for you to do something different from what you do, but that we're all doing it. And don't be afraid of that difference in the room. That's right. Or the conflict. Yeah, I personally really like the impromptu uh, queer dance party that happened in front of <laughs> Mike Pence's house. Yes. I, I love yes. that. I think that is a very creative way yes. to do a direct action. And I think that we have to start thinking about creative ways to do direct action. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, for instance, we um, as an organization are going to have an impromptu march as well uh, today in Jackson Heights because of all the executive orders um, and all the intersectional intersec intersecting identities that are going to be affected by that. On the immigration um, orders. Immigration yeah, immigration orders um, specifically, uh, but uh, with that, we're also going to be giving out information while we do the march. 
So I think combining efforts is also really important. So we're not only going to be visible and out on the street, but we're also going to be giving out Know Your Rights pamphlets and information about different organizations. And I think com combining different direct actions, educational mm -hmm. opportunities, I think it's, you know, it's the only way it's going to be effective. I mean, you're point. doing life and death stuff. I mean, you're creating sanctuaries for people right. who are in danger of being deported and things like that. And I think that's actually a really important point because um, sanctuary spaces, sure, they exist within organizations. That goes without being said. But there's other spaces that are actually becoming sanctuary spaces that understand what that means and the responsibility um, that entails. And that can be, you know, just a community center or it could be someone's house if they have that space. Mm -hmm. So thinking about that in ways outside of what currently exists, but trying to build ourselves and to keep ourselves safe. We all have to be sanctuaries for each but other. But I take your yes. point about humor and cleverness, mm -hmm. too. Yeah. Uh, as an ACT UP veteran, a lot of our success was because we were clever in our messaging and uh, standing on that bridge over 42nd Street and seeing hundreds of thousands of people slowly come <laughs> along. Uh, so many of the signs were so funny and so clever and it was uh, it was fun. You know, activism has to be fun and people have to do it for their own selfish good feelings mm -hmm. and work together for the greater good but but they have to have a good time doing it and do it because they want to do it not just because they think they should do it and humor gets yeah. under his skin i was going to say yes. that's, that's actually his biggest <laughs> right. weakness yes his biggest he's very weak when it comes to poking fun at him Alpha. so i think that has to be yeah. also in, in included in our organizing mm -hmm. strategies that's right Wow. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, we're down to our last minute. Uh, any final thoughts? I wanted to say one thing that's really important, and we sort of got at this, is to look back at the success we've had in the past. Because I was thinking about, like, there's a lot of talk about ACT UP and the success, the ways it was successful, and the strategies, including humor and direct action. And look at that and think about it and adapt it for this day and age. And also celebrate that, you know, this was, this worked. Mm hmm. James. Um, don't lose hope. We can do this. <laughs> well, that's good yeah. to hear. I mean, I want to encourage people to be militant. <laughs> I want people to be militant, aggressive. I think now is the time to really support each other and remember um, all the shared identities that we that we all have. Well, it's a few days into the administration, and I felt terrible, but now I feel a little better. <laughs> and I think I learned my original or organizing principles by watching the civil rights movement on TV. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, I would recommend people go to YouTube and watch Eyes on the Prize, all yeah. mm -hmm. uh, eight or ten mm -hmm. episodes or whatever. Uh, but I look back to the anti-war marches in the 70s for critical mass. So uh, everybody do something, do whatever appeals to you. Uh, but let's all let's all fight back. Thank you for being with us, Linda, James, and Pow. Thank we you. We really Thank appreciate you. all really. your thoughts Thank you all. and all your work. And uh, please come back, and we'll reassess as we go mm -hmm. along. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And we'll be we back will, next week. We will see all of you next week, and uh, you know, hang in there. It's going to be okay. <laughs> I hope. Kind of. Yeah, kind of. Yeah. It's exactly we'll right. Okay. <laughs>